political proposal that we each choose our own manner of being governed. You know, I've been doing this for several weeks now. I still have to read this slogan. I still don't have it memorized. That's how bad of a host I am. Uh, with me tonight, of course, uh, if you've watched us before, you know Andy Catherman and Will Tippins, uh, two moderators at We the Individuals. And it is our absolute pleasure to have with us tonight Jeffrey Tucker, the founder of Liberty.me. So, uh, Jeffrey, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Normally we have these overarching topics. We talk to Dr. Block about Austrian economics, but we've got an hour with you, uh, and we really just kind of want to pick your brain. No, 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 it's fun, yeah. No, right yeah. I mean, right? I mean, spontaneous order, you know? It's... Exactly, and, and I want to surprise you with everything to see how you do uh, yeah. on the fly, of course, because yeah, I don't no. like making things easy on anybody. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're probably going to revisit some old topics. We're going to talk about some topical stuff. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and I'm really, really happy. I just want to point out this is the first episode without Jeff Peterson, and <laughs> it is just a nice break not having to deal with him. Can I you all agree but, on that? You know, it's it's funny. Uh, he was just on, you know, before the show, <laughs> and, and he pointed out that. <laughs> so, he drives me crazy. <laughs> I mean, he drives me crazy because he he sends me his articles and goes, "Oh, read this," and I'm like, "I don't have time." And he's like, "No, please read it." I'm like, "I don't have time." And I go, "Okay, finally." I, so I do. So then I give my reaction, right? And it's always a little bit like, "Well, it's okay," you know. And I have a complaint. Then he argues with me. <laughs> and and so then I think, oh, you know, all right. So then, but then he draws me in. So last night, I mean, true. This is true story. I get off the. I'm on the plane, and I'm like texting and arguing with him, you know. And and I look up, and the whole plane is like empty, you know, the plane had landed. So I'm like, oh God, I get I get off. The plane. <laughs> so then I, you know, I I get on onto the bus to go to the baggage claim, and. And I'm arguing with him some more, and then pretty soon I realized that the bus had gone to baggage claim and reversed itself and gone back to Terminal D already. So I was like... <laughs> <laughs> you had to go chase down your baggage? Yeah, so then, so then I had to go back on the bus all the way like four terminals over because of Jeff Peterson. <laughs> and so then, then I think, I'm going to stop talking to this guy. This is crazy. So then I get my bag and I start walking to my car and like as I'm walking I'm texting with one thumb like this and then I find that I'm on the wrong floor and on the wrong row and because of him I was like an hour late getting home that I otherwise would have been. <laughs> so this is why he said, this is why he said he goes, well I'm glad you're, you're being nice to me because last night you weren't and it's true. I was saying horrible things to him but it wasn't because I was so, I was mad. I like everything. The fact that I wasted a full hour texting with this guy on my tele on my phone, you know. You know, yeah, well, has that ever happened to you? It's just crazy. But I, it makes me feel better about my own frustrations because he always sends me his articles to proofread his grammar, and all I do is just move his commas inside the quotations because we didn't fight a war for independence to use British grammar rules. And as soon as I send it back to me, he just moves the commas back outside the quotations. So I don't even know why I try. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. Let's uh, let's move on because I want to start with with the deep stuff, Jeffrey. Um, mm. uh, it, it's in the news lately. We mm. can't ignore it. We've got to talk about it. I want to hear your thoughts on the crisis with the Syrian refugees. What do we need to do about these? Well, guys? I don't know about you, but I feel like I've learned a lot of things about refugee policy uh, that I didn't know. I mean, you know, there's so much stuff going on in the world. Like, you know, you can't learn everything. But I didn't know until this whole thing happened that the United States government forbids private refugee efforts. Like you, can, mm -hmm. like if you just love Syrians and you want to help them, there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, the The government has nationalized these kinds of policies so that you can't you can't raise and and people are desperate to to bring Syrians here and and help people. They're not allowed to do that. I didn't. I don't think I fully understood that until like yesterday. Yeah, and it, I mean it's nationalizing charity. I mean, I, like, how how much more evil in in this state of sense can you get? Absolutely. Yeah, and and well, you know the tragedy of this. I mean, it shows how just like completely screwed up the world is. A lot of people are going, look, we don't want to bring those piece people over at tra taxpayer expense. They're going to come over here, and then it's going to cost us seventy thousand dollars a refugee. You know, as National Review was saying, this is a a, a, a squandering of taxpayer money. To bring in these 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 weird ragheads, and we just don't need it, and they're on and on like this. Um, but you know, what's what's weird about that is that 
it's it's like you it can't be done privately. It was like it's illegal to do it privately. So public money is really the only option. And I was thinking about this, like what should the libertarian think in this case? You know, you might think I mean there's two two responses, I think. One might just be this like like let them suffer, let them die, who cares? Um because we don't, because we're too penurious, we're not going to spend our tax money that way. Uh, the other, the other way to look at it is to say, look, just because government has nationalized a program, uh, doesn't take away uh, human human rights that would otherwise be available in, in a case of freedom. Like, there's no question that if we had free free migration, that this would be a wonderful opportunity for the United States to bring in. You know, some of the world's smartest, most wonderful, and now tyranny-hating people. Mm -hmm. and, That's how we got Einstein. And yeah, and 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 uh, and 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 yeah. By the way, uh, a century ago, you know, every intellectual in America was warning about the danger of bringing in Jewish refugees because they thought they were just genic for for American racial stock. Yeah. Um, so this is nothing new. But uh, I was thinking about this. Like, what if you said, what if you said, well, uh, my kid has a right to uh, to be educated. And 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 somebody said, well, no, that's not true because your kid's education is going to cost taxpayers uh, twenty-five thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars a year because of public school. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't take away the right to, edu to education, does it? I mean, just because it's a, a public expense, I mean, it's still you have a right to an education. And they're like, no, because your kid's education comes at the expense of, of everybody else. Mm -hmm. do, do you see what I mean? There, to me, that's the analogy. Well, I and I, I think that's a good segue into the argument that I've been making because I see a lot of libertarians are making the obviously very dogmatic open borders. Uh, Andy, you can take a drink. I said dogmatic. Um, the very dogmatic open borders argument that, that we just need to embrace the refugees under this argument. Uh, but what I'm pointing out is we're not talking about open borders. We're talking about government subsidized migration and that's a very different that's not a libertarian thing the government uh, subsidizing like we we believe in charity we don't believe in welfare we believe right. maybe in open borders but we don't believe that Angela Merkel should should bus 700 refugees into a German town with a hundred citizens like she's announced she's gonna do and impose that on them that's not a libertarian thing and the reason I got thinking about this and mm -hmm. I, I I don't know if you've read the art have you read the Lou Rockwell article that came out recently about you know, open borders not necessarily being a libertarian thing. Well, it it it, it did more than that. Basically, it it it, it laid out a, a rationale for rejecting all human rights and all human freedoms. So long. So, you, as, am I? Is it true that you disagree with it? I I, I can't believe it was published. Oh wow. Okay. I, I I thought it made some some legitimate points, but I I don't agree with it. Well, but I'm glad he wrote it because well, it, it yeah. put me in that mindset. I, so, I, well, it can make you can't. Well, your 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 narrow point is legitimate. I mean. Um, I don't know about the German case. I mean, but you're, uh, there's a sense in which government subsidized immigration. I don't even know if that's the right word for it. But these kind of refugee programs are so clumsily handled by the state that they tend to discredit free migration. You know, and and I think that's actually a, a very uh, dangerous thing because, uh, folks. I mean, look, we're all liberty-minded. Uh, free migration of peoples is as at is at the very heart of liberalism and has been. Mm -hmm. 500 years. It's it's no different from free trade. You you can't you can't really call yourself a libertarian. I don't want to you know argue about who gets to call himself a libertarian or not really. But but it is so at the core of the liberal revolution the idea that people should be able to come and go and leave leave countries and 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 choose where they want to live. I mean that's just that the state shouldn't be involved in demographic central planning is like a core principle. So. You got to be very careful when you start talking about this stuff that you're not actually attacking a very core principle of what it means to be free. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to step over you. Did you have something you wanted to jump in and say? Oh well, I was just going to uh, for for those that didn't read that Lou Rockwell piece and uh, <laughs> myself included because I've been sort of off the map lately. Would you like to summarize it? And yeah. Make okay. So what what Lou Rockwell was making and he was uh, citing Hans Hermann. Papa and uh, Murray Rothbard in this was he was arguing that the property owned by the state um, isn't just n not owned at all. It's owned by the people in these communities, and the people in these communities have a right 
to block people from entrance. And, and the one point he made that I think was valid is that in a free society, people would resist mass migration of another culture into their thing. But I don't think that that negates the open borders case. And, and tell me if, if you disagree with me, Jeff, because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What I'm saying is if we had open borders but without subsidizing migration, then these immigrants would have to do the same thing I did when I moved from Florida to West Virginia. They'd have to find somebody to voluntarily decide to rent them or sell them a property to live on, and they'd have to find somebody to voluntarily decide to employ them. And that's going to create a market regulation that's, that's going to allow for migration, but not like this mass-imposed importation of, you know, 700 people. Yeah, I'm, not, you know, the, I'm not sure that's really a, a threat in the United States. I mean, again, I can't speak mm -hmm. to the European case, but... You know, in, in the U.S., you know, people are free to migrate. You know, from from Massachusetts to California, from from Michigan to to uh, to, to Georgia, yeah. and and we've never controlled that. And for whatever reason, it works. And guess what? Freedom works. You know, yeah. I mean. That doesn't mean Georgia is not Georgia anymore. Right? Yeah, the the Georgia culture and the California culture are completely different, but nobody gets upset when Californians move to Georgia or vice versa. I mean, every every single argument that you read among among these kind of strange so-called libertarian, uh, circuitous libertarians who are arguing for border controls right now, could be applied to you know keep keeping <laughs> residents of New Jersey you know from from migrating to uh, Connecticut. You know, different. Yeah. Demographics, different you know tax structure, different welfare uh, structure, different language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know, it, it, guys, this is why we're libertarians. I mean, we believe that freedom offers uh, the answers, and the things work work themselves out. And it always strikes me as ironic. I mean, God, I I can't ever take a coast to coast flight in this country without noticing the obvious fact that this entire country is basically empty. And you know, it's just so uh, to me, the idea that you know any American would talk about, oh, we got too many people here, you know, there's this, it's just crazy. I mean, yeah, there are population centers on the coast, but basically the whole core of this country is is just vast, vast nothing. Every overpopulation argument made in the history of the world has been proven wrong since Thomas Malthus was talking about it in the yeah, yeah. early 19th century. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. and I hate to sound like a you know like a liberal cliche, but our diversity is our strength. I mean, you know, I hate to put it that way. You know, and there's another point about this this circuitous argument regarding public property. You know, we're right now on the internet, and most of the fiber optic cables that are powering what we're doing right now are on public lands. Mm -hmm. You could say if you wanted to, that in, on private property there wouldn't be free speech, right? I mean, right. I, I can't go into the local, uh, I can't go into the, uh, right. uh, the Mexican food restaurant over here and, and start just screaming profanity to everybody. Uh, absolutely. Answer, right? so, so you could use this exact same rationale that people are throwing around at the, about the border point to, to justify controls over the Internet because they live on on public property, and public property is owned by the people. If the people had their way, they wouldn't have free speech, as you can see from every church and every mall and every, every country club. So therefore, you shouldn't be allowed to say whatever you want to um, uh, on the Internet because that's a way of invading people's rights. Well, but if I own a, a, very if I own a website, I can, I can censor that website by, by the, the yeah. private property logic. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, Chris, can I, can I interject for it real quick? Absolutely, Andy. So yeah, I mean, I think the from what my analysis of this, I take a bit more nuanced approach. I feel like the the main conflict with immigration or whatever is like the the public property. It's just it's kind of the tragedy of the commons, right? It's like mm -hmm. we don't really have a good. It's like when nobody has uh, property rights to something, everybody thinks they have property rights to something. And I think um, if I were to take the example of like say like a mall. Like there's free there's free migration in and out of a mall, right? But there are pro there are private residents uh, that inhabit certain spaces of that, right? So if I feel like it it's not a perfect analogy, but like um, people want to have free and open borders to the mall because they because they want to have people patronize their businesses right. here and there. But um, if we if if there were a big mob that were in the middle of the mall. Um, obviously, that would create a problem and cause conflict, and nobody could get here or there to that store or that store. Um, and so, again, it kind of goes goes back to my first point. Would you agree, Jeffrey, that you know these public pro the the big pro problem is we don't have privatization 
of these these public property uh, um, you know the yeah. infrastructure with roads or yeah. And, and then and then you get into another problem. So, you know, so I think you're 100 percent correct about that. It is a it is a kind of a common problem. And so we're left to speculate about what um, private property would be like in absence of these kind of public spaces. Uh, right. It's kind of and, a guess, right? And so so if you're if you're of the belief that you know people are naturally separatist and exclusionary, and you know hate uh, people with dark skin or whatever the thing is, then you're going to say, well, that should be our policy, you know. But but I think what you find in markets is my, markets are ridiculously inclusionary. There's a there's a private um, shopping district in Atlanta, right in the very core of it, uh, in uh, um, in Midtown Atlanta. It's two square miles. It's entirely privately owned with private streets, private police, which I hope we can talk about this because it's really interesting, and uh, private residences. That it's 100% private. Yeah. And they're begging for migration. I mean, they want you in there. There's no, you don't, you don't have to get. It's not gated. You know, you go in there. You know, you know, they're cheering. The merchants want you there. They're desperate for you there. The police welcome you. They're very sweet to you. Yeah. Um, they, you know, the advertisements. Please come in. You know, please migrate. You know, please live here. This markets like people. Pe markets value yeah. human beings. Yeah, because that means an increased production. I mean, uh, just from a purely economic point of view, right? Yeah, and and it's even true. You look you look back in the 19th century and the 19th century America when it's kind of funny to think of it, but I guess it's to an extent true even today. But like every state, like Texas um, and California and you know, just everywhere, um, were advertising all over the Northeast for residents. There they're, they're flyers that you'd pick up. You know, please move to Texas. Here's where you can make your fortune. Here's where you can be truly free. It's true in the Dakotas, all the West. They're desperate for for residents to to move in, because uh, God, without people, you know, places are useless. People people are valuable and people are awesome. <laughs> China's repealing their one child law on this exact concept. They realized that limiting the population in their country was having disastrous effects, and so yeah. they're they're actually reversing that policy. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think the last thing that libertarians need to be even toying with, like we shouldn't even go there, is any kind of s demographic central planning, like, oh, we should have these people and not these kind of people. These are the wrong kinds of people. There are too many people here, not enough people there. That's just that's just not where the way libertarians are supposed to be thinking, and that's that's because freedom works, you know. If I can jump in, uh, yeah, I think ahead. sort of the uh, the crux of the the Hoppian's argument, and I, I I think Hans Hoppe is you know I mean what can I, he's he's an amazing thinker, but you can be a genius and be wrong every now and then. So. Oh, of course, of course, and that's one of the beauties of you know being a libertarian and not not a, an objectivist, perhaps that <laughs> you can you can sort of def, you can uh, dissent within the you know the intellectual hierarchy, but uh, you know, and I love that Block has brought up the point that you know Hoppe, Hoppe has essentially the point is that it's forced integration. Well, of course, the flip side is that borders are forced discrimination or you know imposed discrimination, which, as Jeffrey, you were saying, I mean that 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 is sort of if you if you can see that that is something that the state can and should do, then that sort of to me it's a the bottom of the house of cards and everything else is just yeah, sort of it also violates the rights of those people who want to employ it violates you know the rights of yeah. form yeah. if we believe well, it violates the rights of the people but, in that community yeah. that might want to employ that person exactly. or rent to that person that's exactly that's exactly right i remember a few years ago in, in alabama uh, the state legislature voted to kick out all the illegals then the, all the mexicans went running for their lives and like over the next several months, it was it was it was hilarious. Like if you wanted to get your bathroom tiled, there wasn't <laughs> anybody in the state who knew how the hell to do that. <laughs> if you wanted to like have a brick uh, driveway, it's like I don't know, nobody knows how to make a fucking brick driveway. <laughs> and so after about four months, there it was like getting desperate. I mean, the crops were unpicked, you know, the buildings were unbuilt, the streets were unpaved. And so they said, oh, uh, about that whole illegal immigration thing, uh, it's gone. And so then they all came back and everything got back to normal again. Beautiful, like a South Park episode. <laughs> yeah. Dealing with the the insanity of the Alabama legislature. I, I was born in Alabama. I moved. I moved uh, actually from Alabama between Florida and West Virginia. And when I left Alabama, I thought I, I just got to get out of Alabama. No state can be this bad. And then I moved to West Virginia and realized that it's at least as insane here. <laughs> um, so you know, we'll see where I move. Where I move next. It might, it might not be in the United States. There's some kind of weird conspiracy of silence about the truth about West Virginia. 
actually. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not a native, so I'm still <laughs> I'm still learning some of the dirty secrets here. Um, okay, let's let's kind of shift topics a little bit. I want to stay on something heavy. I think this this brought up a, a lot more than I thought we were going to get out of this, and that's what I like to see. So let's talk about some of these foreign policy issues that are re related to this um, refugee crisis. Um, ISIS obviously is coming up a lot, and with the elections, you know, I think I, saw, I read an article Donald Trump's talking about nu nuking the Middle East. I I just made a video recently, kind of hyperbolizing um, the idea of collateral damage with the example of a nuclear bomb. And then go go figure, Donald Trump's going to take hyperbole seriously. Um, so so what what's your thought on on all this crisis, Jeffrey? Well. I mean, I don't think it's possible to even discuss it without talking about the role of U.S. nation building. And, and Let's talk about it. I mean, look, <laughs> I don't know. You know, you can go back. Nobody wants to talk about the history. They're like, don't tell me about the history. Well, the history is important, you know. I'm, I'm a graduate student in history. You're speaking my language, man. You no, know, I mean, you know, back in the, in the 1980s when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, the U.S. was, was, was like, well, there's some wonderful anti-communist in Afghanistan, uh, they're they're you know, dedicated to the Islamic faith, and that's what mm -hmm. makes them that's what makes them hate the Soviets so much. And mm -hmm. we should support them. And they're freedom fighters. Yep. And and these people were imported all over. They were courted and brought over in first class flights. You know, uh, to to buy conservatives in Washington and and wined and dined and presented to conservative donors as great um, theistic advocates of family values. Uh, people of the book, you know, who hate communism, therefore they're our natural allies. Well, you know, okay, the Cold War ends, uh, Soviets, uh, you know, are out of Afghanistan. These people are, are the uh, the new regime, and it's the uh, uh, the Mujahideen uh, becomes the Taliban. Sure. And then the Taliban becomes, you know, uh, gradually over time, Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Now, Al Qaeda gradually over time becomes ISIS. You know, I mean, th these these people. Uh, first of all, they were they were courted and loved by the U.S. not too many decades ago, mm -hmm. and and conservatives were going around telling everyone. And by the way, the people on the left were like very suspicious about this whole thing. You know, sure. Uh, sure. The conservatives were were loving these people and telling and browbeating everybody that if you love God and country and family, you better damn sure better love these Islam Islamic extremists because they're wonderful people. And I, you know, look, I re actually like remember this and thinking, meh, I don't know. You know, I remember riding up on the elevator one time with one of these guys. <coughs> I was going to a lunch and I was, you know, like 10 years old or something, but I was on Capitol Hill. <coughs> and I got into the elevator and there was this, this scary man with a turban and, and, I don't know, it seemed like he had a, like a lot of knives or something and wearing some strange garb. And he smelled to high heaven. I thought, what the hell does this guy come from? And at, I went up to the top floor of the building. It turns out he was the featured luncheon speaker, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he was he was a freedom fighter. I was like, nah, I don't know. Was, you know. This is kind of weirding me out a little bit. Yeah. And and then you know, so then then twenty and then then twenty five years ago, you know, the first George Bush, you know, goes after Saddam Hussein for this for this absurd oil dispute with with Kuwait, uh, followed by by inspections, and then you know, all throughout the nineties, the Clinton administration is bombing the hell out of. Iraq and and uh, 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 and sanctions that are killing hundreds of thousands of children, making people, you know, increasingly angry. And finally, there's an you know another invasion that overthrew Saddam Hussein and unleashed, you know, uh, you know, and, and basically under U.S. sponsorship, you have a you know a Shiite government uh, established there, and you know the whole country laid waste, and and the extremist elements, you know, in, you know, increasingly radicalized. Uh, apparently, the last, and then of course the invasion of Afghanistan. You know, hilarious. We're now taking the 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 place of the Soviets. I mean, if you're old enough to remember this, I mean, like I became an anti-communist because of what the Soviets were doing in Afghanistan. Right. You know, and, and invading Afghanistan. Just for anybody that doesn't know the history there, as well, is particularly insane. Because not only were the Soviets driven out of Afghanistan, but when Britain invaded Afghanistan, they came back with one person. One person survived that invasion. Nobody has ever been able to successfully, and even if we we fall into the neocon paradigm, nobody's been able to yeah. do this successfully. That's insane. It's insanity. You know, absolutely. And and then the, the Libyan situation, you know, Qaddafi kept going from being enemy to friend, enemy to friend, and then finally he was overthrown, unleashing all kinds of other hell. And so, so now we've got what all the non-interventions were predicting all along, which is, you know, a, a region-wide, you know, killer death cult. Yeah. yeah. 
What's so, you know, how can you how can you ignore this history? I mean, you know, I mean, and and really, it's it's not because of Islam. I you know, I have a lot of Muslim yeah. friends. It's not Islam, and I'm tired. We're not dealing with Turkey, right? Yeah, no, that's right. And you know, this this yeah. these are people that are mad about basically 30 years of nonstop violence and political intervention and and death imposed by the West. I'm and I know it's so unfashionable to say it, but it's just true. I mean, how can people just you know just ignore this? It's just it's just this is why I think the best path. I mean, it's not you can't unravel problems like this right away, but. <clears throat> what choice do we have but peace and free trade? I mean, the same peace, free trade, and free migration. I mean, this is the only policy. War isn't going to help. It's it's only going to make things worse. Absolutely. Well, let me give you room to jump in. Oh, I was just going to say, and what is so particularly maddening, and is that so many people who, especially lately in the wake of this uh, the Paris uh, attacks, it seems like so many people who are reputable in their uh, and and. Uh, have legitimate knowledge of of some of these things are are still sort of jumping the ship and going over to you know the you know the, almost like the neocon side. It's 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 really disheartening to to, to see. To what, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? You mean that I, people advocating like like more more like a ramping up of the war on terror? You mean? Yeah, right. And so even people, for instance, I was having a conversation with someone who's quite knowledgeable about. We we were talking about the the you know the the progression of the of Iran, you know, from the 1953 coup to 79 revolution. And they tried to say that the 79 revolution, you know, you know overthrowing the the U.S. and Salt Shah was not because uh, of any sort of imperialism, you know, that had been built up, but it was simply because uh, they the the uh, the West had tried to simply uh, push them too far in their their women's rights, and so it was just it was Islam's fault because they're too regressive, and you know of course that that cycles into you know more justification for why this this time it's serious we got to get in there and kick ISIS's ass you know that sort of thing so it it is it's just it's amazing yeah and 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 the the Islamophobia you know is like completely out of control I, as every year that goes by I think it can't get worse but it does get worse. And right now it's 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 insane. I mean, I've got people texting me, you know, uh, lectures. It sounds like George L. Orwell. We've always been at war with Islam, yeah. you know. And and these people are just so they're they're so. It seems like there's so much fear that's been whipped up in so many people lately uh, that it, it's kind of it's kind of terrifying in a way. I mean, just people are so many people are losing their minds over, especially this. The last week, you know, with all especially especially given you know the contribution that Islam, as a tradition, made to the building of the West. I mean, you know, there are 500 years in Spain long before you know really uh, the first sort of glimmer of modernity between you know the 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 eighth century and 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 uh, and about the 14th century, when um, the so-called Dark Ages. Yeah, but you know, in, in Cordoba, Spain, I mean, there were there were li lit streets, were the largest libraries in the in the world. Uh, prosperity was was and and tolerance was actually beginning to bloom. It was under an, Isla an Islamic rule, and there were Christians and Jews, and they and there was th thanks to commerce and you know intermarriage and you know free association, all three religions were profoundly affected by each other and changed. That's why Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were all different in the 15th century is versus the say the 7th century they had all been profoundly affected by uh, engagement with each other and it was Islam that brought um, lo love of learning and, and technology and uh, mathematics and really a love of, of the possibility of human progress to Christianity which which before the 8th century was a pretty dreary religion you know people just sitting around uh, waiting for Christ to return, uh, and, and I mean, it was you know, it was a very you know, I, you read Saint Augustine, you get a sense of what it was yeah. like. Right? Yeah. And so, I know. Let's, let's not worry about innovating. Let's just be uh, monastics, right? That's right. And so then, then suddenly, and then you you jump forward to the 14th century, and you're suddenly you're reading Saint Thomas Aquinas, and he's he's quoting, um, you know, Aristotle at length, and calling him the philosopher, and acting like you know. He's as you know on the level of of, of Christ in terms of uh, authority figures. Well, where did that come from? I mean, that was that was because of the books preserved by by Islam mm -hmm. and shared with the Christian West by the Islamic faith. You know. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And Judaism was changed, and Judaism made its contribution to both Islam and Christianity. So this is a, a beautiful multicultural society and the first really great civilization coming at that that emerged, you know, out of the the collapse of of, of Rome. Uh, you know, hundreds of years went by where there was just, as you said, there was darkness, and then the light began to burn where Islam ruled Spain. That was the that was the birthplace of modernity. And so for us to look at this now and go, oh, well, Islam's, you know, it's like amazing to me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, well, we've got some heavy topics out of the way. Let's move to some easier stuff here. Uh, another thing that's been coming up lately that, hey, this is an easy one, Jeff. I'm just going to let you dish on it because we <laughs> all know what you're going to answer, but it's going to be fun to li listen to your wax poetic. Uh, let's talk about this nonsense with this $15 minimum wage. And I want to I hear you talk about debt forgiveness because I made an argument about this the other day that, that mm -hmm. threw uh, uh, Jeff Peterson for a he, he thought I was a left libertarian, for instance, but I want to hear from you. <laughs> You, uh, were you were you favoring forgiving the student loan debt? I, w I was making an argument for it. Let me tell you what my argument was. I'd like to hear it. You know, I haven't thought this through entirely, but I I got to tell you, I'm just part of me is slightly sympathetic also. So okay, yeah. well, I think you're going to agree with me, but it has to have context. And the context is obviously we're capitalists, right? We're all anarcho-capitalists. We're talking. We want to privatize education. We want the end government subsidies. We want to end these silly laws that affect loans and interest rates and make these artificial problems um, created by government. So we're talking about privatizing education and, and that is the context in which this comes from. But forgiving federal student loans seems like the capitalist position because the government makes a ton of money off of these loans. Mm. And so we're talking about cutting off a revenue stream to mm. the most evil entity in the world which is the government mm. and to me it just looks more like a tax cut than anything else, right? Yeah. Well, the other thing is that, I mean, they're not regular loans, right? You can't just declare bankruptcy or whatever. I mean, basically, I mean, are, are the criminal penalties, are there, it's different from regular loans, right? Well, th there's a little bit in favor of them and a little bit against them. You can't declare bankruptcy on student loans, but you also can't garnish wages or anything like that. So there's a little bit on both sides, and this is where th th the, these laws are almost contradicting each other. So obviously do away with these stupid laws that affect it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. You can't declare bankruptcy. But, but your your essential point is is like, who benefits from from their per perpetuation? You know, who's who's winning? Exactly. It's yeah. not it's not private lenders. It's the federal government. Well, yeah, it's, there, yeah. There are some. I feel like there are some uh, private lenders, like maybe not anymore going forward for new issuance. But yeah, there, I feel like there, there are, still are most, some. Most liabilities were bought out a few years ago. It was during the Obama administration. I can't remember the exact year, but they were bought out completely by the federal government. Okay, so they they kind of like re, uh, or they uh, well just similar to what the they bonds did. basically they bought exactly. the bonds from them exactly okay. and and now student loans like I mean I'm in college and I know any student loan information I get is directly it's it's federal government it's not even through a private entity well let me ask you this um, because I don't actually know the answer because I really haven't looked into the student loan issue is the student loan liabilities are those liabilities included as part of the national debt. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Well, it, they shouldn't be because it's not it's not government debt. It's private debt, but the um, recipient of the debt servicing is the government, so it wouldn't be part of the national debt. I wonder if it would almost like if you're talking about um, accounts like ingoing and outgoing, I wonder if you would almost subtract that from the government debt. Not that I would agree with that because I think that's, that's kind of like Clinton surpluses, it's really just borrowing from Social Security. Well, I tell you, I'm open to that argument. I mean, I, there's something uh, grotesque about, about these loans and, and the way they've affected people's lives. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, um, I'm, I find it mortifying and, um, you know, like there's something unjust about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't quite put my finger on it. I, you, get, you can say that, that uh, people have benefited from the loans and therefore should have to pay them, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're profoundly distorting people's lives and some of these degrees are absolutely completely worthless. I mean, the kids were basically robbed, let's face it, I mean, you know, a lot of them. So, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely open to a libertarian case for repudiating uh, student loan debt. Yeah, I think it has to be it's done not, in the right time. It's context. not a no-brainer to me anyway. Now, the, the only tricky thing about this argument that I always like to make clear is repudiating the, the federal student loan debt. I always like to make that clear, not private student loans. That would be right. that would be socialist in itself. But doing that without cutting off subsidies is essentially a step towards nationalization, so it has to be done under the right 
uh, concept, or else we just have single payer uh, education, and I don't I don't advocate that, obviously. Uh, but I it, just, it occurred to me the other day, and I was like, I can't believe I've never heard anybody argue this. So I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts. And yeah, I don't know. I'm interested yeah. if, that I I think I may have toyed with that in my mind, but I've never actually written it or, or really looked into it. But uh, there's something there's something that's troubling uh, to me about about this whole subject and. Um, uh, well, in any, any case, you know, when, when you hear uh, people on the left arguing this, let's just say it's never, like, profoundly offended me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. You can tell there's something there, but, yeah, you know. Yeah, I get you. What about these uh, these college kids that are also arguing for this $15 minimum wage? I mean, even Hillary Clinton's not going that far. She's arguing for a $12 minimum wage. This is <laughs> weird. Like, they should, I don't know why. I mean, if you favor 12, why not 15? Why not 50? I mean... Yeah. Um, and you kind of ever pin them down on it, you know. Uh, Donald Boudreau, uh, economist at George Mason University on Fee, uh, has an has an article I think that came out early this morning. But uh, and it was a kind of his introductory statement on the minimum wage. And his his point was that you know, look, if if minimum wage is good, it should be a million dollars. And if it's not, then it should be zero. I mean, you know. Everything in between is we're just arguing about you know, just nonsense, really, and it should be zero. I mean, I, I I consider the 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 minimum wage is a violation of human rights um, because it it prevents me from having remunerative work at a price that I'm willing to work, and and mm -hmm. I don't know why people don't look at it that way because it, it is, and gentlemen, I mean. Uh, you know, th it's an undeniable fact. If you go back a hundred years ago and look at all the people who were arguing for the minimum wage, the reason they favored it was to exclude undesirables from the workforce, and they thought black, black people working on the railroads. Makes sense. Was, eugenics. Well, that was that was yeah. Black people working on the rail railroads in the 1930s, but eugenics was was the was the progressive era. We're talking about 1910, mm -hmm. 1913. Okay. They, they were not federal laws yet; they were state laws. Mm -hmm. But all the the uh, the eugenics economists, which were basically everybody's eugenicist. I mean, and that is not an exaggeration. I mean, eugenics was was like an American article of faith. Um, uh, the idea was that look, we can't just chloroform these people, and that's a direct quote, actually, from uh, from uh, I think it was Frank Tausig in his book Principles of Economics. We can't chloroform these people, but at least we can cut off their means of sustenance, and at least uh, at least they'll be disincentivized to have children, and then maybe we can wipe them out in one generation. Wow. <laughs> I, I know I've read some of the... Per Walter Williams writes a lot on minimum wage and its racist policies, but I've never heard the eugenics argument. Yeah. I'm so, going to have to get into this. Yeah, now. you have to go back further in time to find it, because by the 1930s, yeah, it's definitely anti-black, anti, anti, anti right? But right. The white, white supremacist labor unions, essentially. But if you go back, uh, go back 34 years earlier... Uh, you're gonna you're gonna find the really nasty stuff, and and that's that's that was basically an exterminationist campaign, that was the, yes racial, but also inclusive of everybody that was considered to be considered to be you know just not fit. And, uh, and the same. I mean the idea is like the workforce belongs to us as a people. And at the same time, going uh, going on at the same time, you have the Supreme Court case, you know, of uh, Buck v. Vell, the one that you uh, you had the the state uh, essentially just um, sterilizing people compuls compulsory. Oh yeah, compulsory yeah. sterilization. Yeah. And so it makes well, sense to exclude them from the workforce. I mean, the yeah. idea is that we as a community, you know, uh, can only have the fittest survive. And that means only the fittest should be permitted into the workforce, which was seen as a kind of a, a, a sort of a, it was like a, like a favor. You're giving people the opportunity to work. And you should only do that with people that are of, of the kind of uh, superior racial stock um, and have a, the proper genetic comp components that, that we want in our country. Um, I mean, it's almost impossible to understand many of the policies that emerged out of the progressive era. And it's almost like it's almost like out of the movie Gattaca with uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Ethan Hawke. Have you seen that, Jeffrey? No, that sounds amazing. I'm, I'm very interested in this topic. Yeah, way. watch watch Gattaca. Uh, uh, I think it's one of Ethan Hawke's earlier movies. It's wow, pretty that good. Sounds it's awesome. pretty good. I'm gonna write that down. Um, it, it was the it's, it's, eugenics was the very first. A form of scientific central planning in this country, and it resulted in minimum wages and also immigration controls. The very first broad-based centrally planned immigration controls we got in the 1924, uh, I believe it was, 
um, were, imp were 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 motivated by eugenics and also and also fear of the Jews, fear of East Europeans especially. Um, the idea was like, you know, look, you can't you can't just let in people who don't have diseases. That's not enough. You've got to have superior racial stock because these people will have children. And they will poison uh, the the racial stock of this country, and demographics is is destiny. So, I mean, it was basically 1924. We had the first central centrally dem central demographic planning, based on eugenic motivations, um, and it resulted in the first widespread restrictions on immigration this country had ever had. Wow. Well, um, I, that's incredibly, incredibly interesting to me. I've never heard the eugenics argument for that. We are actually moving along really fast because we're having a great conversation. I have a ton of topics listed down, and we're not going to get to most of them. Andy, though, I don't, I don't want to take up um, some of the stuff he wanted to talk about because he actually wanted to ask you uh, just kind of about liberty.me. So th don't, yep. don't let me mis, uh, misquote you, Andy. L take it away. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, well, let me let me uh, pause that question because that, that's my second question. But going off of your, our kind of segueing off of our last conversation, sure. Um, are you are you still involved, Jeffrey, with uh, Praxis? I am. I, I wrote the the history and culture uh, part of their curriculum, and okay. I I love to speak at their events, and I follow. I follow what they do very, very closely. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, what Praxis is and kind mm -hmm. of like, kind of? Yeah. I feel like you know, with given the whole like, I feel like there's a huge entitlement mentality with young people these days, and they're they're really missing the boat about you know not whether they're getting screwed with not a very good education. I feel like uh, I heard about Praxis and just a great way of getting people you know that that uh, apprenticeship type of model of of getting educated and getting experience. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? They had a problem actually uh, at the very outset even starting this program because of, of uh, federal federal laws. The idea initially was that they would be pure apprentices and that the tuition would uh, basically cover their living experiences and even even pay uh, pay to be employed. Now, of course that doesn't work with federal labor law. So now they're typically paid minimum wage to do apprentice style stuff and, and the tuition you know covers the the costs associated with, uh, you know, the it's a one-year degree program basically, and it takes about ten hours a week, and the rest of the time you spend, you know, working in in a field of your your choice, and it can be, a, you know, a startup company, an old line company, a hotel, uh, you know, cr cr you know, crane leasing services, you know, a, an edgy you know, app company in in Austin. They they send people all over the country, so they work very hard in these partner relationships. But the awesome thing is that it gives it gives these kids um, commercial experience while they're in, in school, and that's amazing to me. I mean, I'm I'm sure you've watched all this nonsense from Yale and the University of Missouri, and oh. I can't help it. You know, when I watch this crap, I'm like, hey, you know, my first thought is you guys need a life, man. <laughs> you know? I mean, like, you know, you need to, like, have to serve a cup of coffee to an angry customer and right. fuck mm -hmm. it up, you know? You need, you need to be, you know, checking people in an airline and have somebody screaming that they're, that they're going to miss their connecting flight. And, and you know, I mean, that's the reality <laughs> of commercial life. I mean, you, do, you become a better person. You become more tolerant and, and you learn something about the real world. These people are, I mean, you watch, you've watched all the, the videos. I mean, it's just insufferable. They have nothing to do, nothing to do. Absolutely. And they're going to graduate, and oh my God, they're going to go into a commercial marketplace, and the only place these people could work, maybe, is at like like uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department or something like that, <laughs> where, you, where you, get, you, know, you get hired and, and they can't fire you for the rest of your life, and you don't have anything to do. Right. <laughs> <That's the only laughs> but, but so anyway, Praxis is, is awesome because you know, a lot of people just don't want to slog through that four years and spend $250,000 or whatever it's going to cost. And... Uh, and 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 get out with really nothing to show for it and no commercial experience. Praxis sure. gives you that practical experience. And also, hey, here's another cool thing about Praxis: it builds in a network for you. Mm. And and I, you guys have all been there. You remember what it was like? You graduated from high school and you've got all your friends. Everything's awesome. Everybody loves you. Don't ever change. And then and then and then like one day the next, you're completely your whole uh, social network is blown apart. And you have to start all over again. So then you go to college. And then you do the same thing all over again. You develop, you know, networks of friendship, and everybody's happy. Everybody loves each other, and yay, yay, yay. And then suddenly you graduate, and like, whoa, now what? And you find yourself, 
you know, slogging around trying to be desperate to find a job, you know, and you end up, you know, at the, at the, at the local, um, you know, if, if you're lucky, you get a job as a server somewhere, a waiter in a restaurant or somebody like that, but you don't have a network to draw on. Right. So Axis gives you that professional network. Um, of, of many, many businesses where they all know your talents, there's people willing to vouch for you as a worker and a, and a valuable contributor to the great commercial enterprises. That's just, that's just awesome. I mean, my friend Isaac Morehouse established it, and I think it was, I think it was genius. Um, so he asked me to, uh, to write a lot of the curriculum, which I, which I did in exchange for which I, I got stock options. So I do have, you know, Full disclosure, right? But sure. <laughs> I'm a stockholder in the company. So. Well, good for you. Good for you. Well, um, I think it's a great, a great program. Um, I'm a, I'm a software developer, and uh, I, I think it's just, you know, a great field. The barrier to entry to be a, a software developer is just so low these days. If you have the, um, the motivation, and I mean, there's so many um, really great like boot camps out there where you can become a, a developer without even like investing in a four-year degree and uh, I mean most of the stuff that I know today is what I've kind of just taught myself sure. and uh, you know I've had to keep my keep my my skills uh, up to date and sharpen my sword um, so that kind of brings me to my question about liberty.me and I know it's a, a tech startup as of you know what is it a year or two old now these days it is not even t it's not even two years it's about a year and a half uh, uh, by the way, you what you said about your own education. I just spoke at Google recently, and oh, I, awesome! And I talked to a ton of uh, people who work there, and they all tell the same story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I uh, so I, I was just curious as far as um, Liberty.me. Like, I'm I'm interested in kind of the nerdy stuff. I'm not going to get too down in the weeds, but I'm just curious. You know, how are you guys? Um, I I know the UI, and I know the the experience has changed from like what you guys originally had in the beta to now what you have now. Yeah. Maybe could you like maybe walk me through like what yeah. uh, how you guys have evolved, how you guys yeah, have yeah, taken yeah. feedback? Absolutely. Yeah, of course, it's really exciting for me. I mean, I kind of laid out uh, 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 in the shortest possible way, but um, you know, I, I I had I had some uh, startup capital and I wanted to spend it wisely. Um, I um, I decided to go with WordPress because we just had too tight a deadline, and I knew there's a lot of stuff out there, but if you can believe it, and if you look at the platform now, the entire thing runs on WordPress, which is awesome. Like, you couldn't even imagine that five years ago. The whole thing would have collapsed, because right. WordPress is, and PHP especially is not very scalable, you know? But it's a lot of fine-tuning by some really top-notch top, top -notch programmers, and, and we got the damn thing to work. But initially, the design of it and the functionality of it was to be very effervescent. I wanted a place of peaceful and quiet where people could go, and and you know it was very open, and uh, you know um, you know I don't I don't know how to describe. It. I, w I wanted that sort of that that eternal space kind of look and feel. Um, but then after I did it, I realized actually this is boring. Uh, you know, <laughs> and so I went the completely other direction, and now made it just wildly busy and insane. You know, with with everything that's available available from the, from the front page, and and it actually works a lot better. So aesthetically, it's not as pleasing as it was initially, but you know, you go with what the customer wants, and it's really obvious that that's what that's what that's what people want. That's really interesting. It's like you know, you you were designing a site that like you would like, that's right. but then you got feedback that like you know, well, every, everybody wants you know all these different widgets going everywhere. They do. They do. They want it all. And now you're on. And it's like whoa. You know, it's really exciting, whereas before it was well, it was a little boring. You know, I mean. Yeah, like you said, it pleased me from an aesthetic point of view because I'm sort of a minimalist. But people yeah. were always writing me like, okay, I'm a member, but I don't know what to do. I'm just yeah. looking at the screen, you know, and it doesn't tell me anything. Well, <laughs> I'm more of a, like a, a middle tier to back end person. I, like UI is like, um, I'm just going to check out, you know, mm -hmm. have somebody else do that because I'm, I'm not artistic. I'm not... I'm not able to think, you know, user experience, user experience. So I think what you guys have done is really good, and thank you. Um, uh, I just have lots of compliments. Well, you know, I'm 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 using the same team uh, right now to rebuild fee.org. Okay. I'm, I'm the director of digital development there, and we're we're. It's funny after my WordPress experience on Liberty.me, which was essential, and I would never go back on it. But since we have the time, and there's no great urgency at fee.org, you know. Uh, to, and 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 there's going to be a lot less, um, you know, tools. Uh, 
I'm building that entirely in in, in .NET. Awesome. awesome. Very cool. All right, we're uh, running short on time. We're, we got about nine minutes until uh, the end of the hour, and I like to, to end early, but I do have a couple quick closing questions for you, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, number one, in a world in which Donald Trump becomes president, what country do I move to? Yeah, thank you for asking the question that way. <laughs> I mean, this guy terrifies me. You know, it's interesting to hear him talk. I, I, I Maybe you know the story, but I didn't care anything about Donald Trump until I heard him speak in Las Vegas, and he began to speak. And my jaw was on the floor because it was it was like he, he was he was reading um, uh, Mises's omnipotent government and trying to follow the path of of, of the rise of fascism in, in Europe and the in the interwar years. I was I was amazed, you know, just how closely <laughs> the autarky, the anti-immigrant, the fear of the other, the demonization of other countries, you know, the focus on trade, and then is you know he pays pays respects to religion, you know. So he, he's like a, he's like a right socialist in a way, you know. Yeah, and, absolutely. And even now, when he talks, he's like, "We're going to make this central plan work to sheer willpower and energy, you know, and 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 brilliance." And it's like we're going to make this country great again. Yeah, that's, that's all you need to say. <laughs> Just well, it's like you got you got uh, George W. Bush. We got to abandon the free market to save the free market. <laughs> Donald Trump says, "I like capitalism, but but only if the peer person's smart." I mean, it's the same kind of. Just nonsense. Right? Yeah, well, he, he represents a tradition of thought, and it's a non-leftist sort of collectivism, which I'm yeah. from a from a theoretical point of view. This is very interesting and challenging to libertarians. We're always so used to being against the socialists that we're uh, we tend to be a little bit like not uh, how do you say? It's like uh, we have ten ears in a way uh, when it comes to sort of the threats from the right. And um, so we don't recognize them and call them what they're... I'm, I'm glad to see more and more people just calling it what it is, which is fascism. The New York Times, they ran an article yeah. uh, about this and about the rise of, of the radical right in Europe. And, and it was funny because they said, this is a funny mix of policies in the New York Times. They're, they're like, they're not physical conservatives. They love the welfare state. In fact, they want more of it. They will love immigration okay. fixes and they like protectionism. Yeah. But they're also pro-religion... And they're pro-family, um, you know, also, and they believe in the traditions of a nation and patriotism. I mean, it's like, you know, yeah, that's a thing. You know? <laughs> so so where, where, do, where do I move if this happens? If you're free to move, I mean, I, I, I think New Zealand, uh, Costa Rica. New Zealand uh, is my choice. I'm glad to hear you say yeah, that. Look, I spent a week there the, the earlier this year, and oh... My God. Well, I used to say Switzerland because they got the third freest economy, but then I found out it's cold and they they don't speak English, and then I found New Zealand, and I was like, this <laughs> yeah. is so New Zealand is so awesome. I, I can't tell you the number of people I met in New Zealand. I said, so what? Uh, where are you from? They go, like, well, I'm from Chicago. I'm from you know uh, Los Angeles, whatever. And I was like, what are you doing in New Zealand? They're like, well, you know, it was funny. I came here on like a camping trip, and I just didn't go home. <laughs> 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 well, I'm um, I'm glad I don't have to change my mind on my escape country. I I got my eye on New Zealand as well. All right, final question, Jeff, and then I'm going to let you go. I warned you before the show. I am going to ask you for a book recommendation. You get one. I'm going to take it to New Zealand with me, so you get one recommendation. Okay, you yeah, I, and I I've got a wonderful recommendation. You've never heard of it. Uh, I had heard this book recommended to me for like years, and I never bothered to read it. And I had the occasion to read it because I wrote an introduction to it. And I tell you what, uh, uh, gentlemen, really, this book just blew my mind. It was I don't know how to describe it, but if you've um, they're like the greatest dessert you've ever eaten. That's what it was like to read this book. Uh, the book was written in 1890 by Auberon Herbert. And I'm convinced that, that this book was doomed because the author's name is so boring. But he was a, he was a British MP, Auberon Herbert, and the book is called The Right and Wrong of Compulsion by the State. And in my entire life of reading uh, libertarian, liberal libertarian uh, literature, anarchist-oriented literature, I've never read anybody who's more poetic and more just like rock solid on everything, in a way that that in, just inspires you know me to to no extent. You can get it free online. It's called The Right and Wrong of Compulsion by the State by Auburn Herbert. And to me, it's like the the most beautiful presentation. 
of the liberty philosophy I've I've ever encountered, and I include, you know, in that evaluation, you know, all the greats. I think this is the best. Wow, I love that recommendation. That's the first recommendation I've got that's not already on my bookshelf as well. I started asking this because I wanted to pick up books, and this is the first time I actually get to go buy one. So no, you're gonna you're, awesome. you're, just, you're, you're just gonna be you're just gonna be thrilled, and and I I, I was I was happy. I truly like. I feel I've, like I've heard the name before. Was he an anarchist? Was he, I read a book over the summer on anarchist history that's like 700 pages. I feel like it's in there. He's, he probably he's listed as an anarchist. I don't think he considered himself. I mean. I don't it was 1890. A lot of people didn't. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't know that he really addressed the question of whether or not there should be a state. You know, in the sense that we think of it. I'm not even sure that was a, the way they were thinking. Like, well, Benjamin Tucker was and everything. But I can tell you, this guy's yeah. like way better than the American anarchists. Way better. He was really? awesome because he was pro capitalist and pro pro private property and pro for, pro free trade and pro wow. anti intellectual uh, property in favor of civil liberties and and freedom of drug use and. I mean, like free press and universal privatization and secession, you name it. I mean, the guy was awesome, and they all could have, and I love the way he writes because it all sort of rolls out of first first principles, you know. And he was a member of parliament. Awesome. Oh, wow. Awesome, awesome dude. I mean, just. I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy this as soon as we get off because I have to have a print copy. That's just me. I got Well, and, so and Liberty Fund has a beautiful edition of, of his book that you can get for for virtually nothing. And I promise if you, if you spend time reading it, you'll get on these hangouts and you won't be talking about anything else. Yeah. Nor <laughs> Normally I talk about Josiah Warren, and I literally only said that because that's another word that makes Andy just take a drink. drink. So I did that just to help get Andy drunk. You're gonna, uh, Herbert. You're gonna love Herbert. Okay, I, I really am genuinely excited about that, so I'm glad I asked that question. All right, it is two minutes until the top of the hour. Uh, we're gonna call this a night. Um, I didn't get a list of shows to plug, but keep your eye on Liberty.me because I know that there are some great shows coming up this week. So I don't have any specifics to plug, but I'm sure they're out there, and you can decide which ones to watch. We will not be back next week because because it is the day before Thanksgiving. So everybody watching, have a fantastic and safe holiday. Eat some turkey, take a nap, and we will be back the week after. Uh, at the same time on Wednesday. So, Jeff, thanks again for having us thank on. You. Wonderful show. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.